welcome back to another edition of Down the Middle. Uh, you want to talk credit? You want to talk fixed income? You want to talk bonds? Do those words mean absolutely nothing to you? They will. They will very shortly. Uh, I can't be any more pleased today. We have with us Peter Shear. Uh, he's the head of macro strategy at Academy Securities. He's only been around for a quarter of a century in the fixed income markets. He, he, he's seen everything from the, the evolution of structured credit to plain old investment grade bonds in your grandmother's bond portfolio all the way down to the junk spectrum and back. And he's got geopolitical insights. So we're in for a huge treat. Thank you for being here today. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited. Um, so walk us through for just novice people who aren't so familiar with the bond market. I mean, you hear numbers like $300 trillion and it's kind of meaningless. But how big are the, the kind of the global how big is the global debt market? How big is it compared to the global equity market? And how has it evolved in the last 25 years? So it's much bigger than the global equity market. I, you know, and I think a couple of things. So I think in pure size, it's probably 300 trillion. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, ish, yep. And it's mixed between really, I always think of it as like sovereign and very safe sovereign debt. So mm -hmm. U.S. government debt, you know, German government debt, Italian debt. Mm -hmm. Then you kind of move down the spectrum into emerging markets. Um, and then you've got corporate debt. And corporate debt can really kind of be defined as there's investment grade, then there's high yield, and then there's private transactions, so smaller deals. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of looking at that entire spectrum. And the other part that I think people don't think about enough, though it's getting a little bit more attention, there's this constant kind of rolling of debt. So debt's constantly maturing, new debt's being issued. So, you know, every month the U.S. Treasury is going to issue $30 billion or so of 10 years, $30 billion or so of 30 years. And they're going to do that the next month, and they're going to do it the month after. Mm -hmm. And those sizes have been increasing, but it's this constant evolution. It's, you know, in the stock market, you get an IPO once in every stock's lifetime. Occasionally there's add-on or secondary sales. But every single day there's new bonds coming to market to replace the old bonds. So it's mm -hmm. kind of an evolving process, and it's something you got to watch. And you know, I always try and simplify it as you think about two things. One is yield risk. And so if you're in the US, you really think of what is the treasury yield gonna be? And it ranges from the short term to the long term, and the long term right. is gonna have bigger impact. And then you think about spread risk. And spread is that element that pays above treasury. So what should investment grade company pay more than the US treasury? A premium. Premium, yes. And I think if you kind of think of it that way, you can kind of come up with where the relative value is, what's interesting, and often signals for what it means for other markets like equities, because credit often does drive the equity market. You know, I don't think people quite understand that. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, when, when, when Jay Powell came on, I was very much enthusiastically looking forward to his leadership. I had, when I, when I worked for Richard Fisher, I, I knew that Powell had followed my work. I knew he wanted to shrink the balance sheet. I knew he wanted to get rates up to 3%, the, the shortest term rates. And what people don't quite understand is how what happened, Halloween 2018, changed everything for Jay Powell, who has a background in private equity, who speaks with hedge funds, who understands the credit markets, who understands what things like duration are. And yet, when the, the debt of General Electric bonds were downgraded on, on Halloween of 2018, it set off a daisy chain of events that culminated in the issuance you're talking about, high yield issuance, closing down for 41 days. That was a record. Mm -hmm. uh, and it bled through to the equity markets mm -hmm. and how that terrible Christmas Eve uh, in, in the stock market was in 2018. And this prompted the Powell pivot. Yeah. And But people don't understand that it wasn't what happened in the stock market. It was what started with GE's bonds. Yeah, and so you had GE get downgraded, and this was already a time there was a lot of concern about the size of triple B companies. So you had Budweiser bonds were struggling, you had AT&T was struggling. Sure. So some of these largest issuers, and I think they started responding and helping their bondholders, and this is something I talk a lot about, is we called it a debt diet. So these companies went on a debt diet yeah. and started cutting back on and dividends. Just, I don't yeah. want to interrupt, but yeah. a triple B bond is the right above the junk line, yes. so people understand it. And it's, what, 52, 53% of the market? It's a big part of the market, okay. and it is critical to understand. So there's a division between what's called triple B minus is the lowest part of investment grade and double mm -hmm. B plus. Okay. And it's actually a fairly you know, small difference in credit. 
but it has a huge impact because a lot of companies, when they invest in bonds, even if they give it to an outside bond manager, mm -hmm. they will stipulate that it has to go into investment grade bonds. Right. A lot of pension funds and state and local pension funds are exclusively investment grade bonds. So if you lose that triple B minus and go to double B plus, it often cuts off a huge number of your buyers. A lot of insurance companies, in fact, become forced sellers. Right. And it cuts off access to the bank market in a different way. So mm -hmm. it's a very dramatic change. It's just because of all these rules that are in place. You know, I thought maybe in 2008, when some of these rules became so problematic, we'd see a smarter way to look at it. But we still have this very you know, finite cutoff between what it means to be an investment grade company, what right. it means to be a non-investment grade. And so these companies, I thought, felt worked very hard for it. But and this is coming up a little bit more now in terms of ESG. When they fought and did these things to protect the debt, they weren't doing it because they liked the debt holders. They, liked, they did it because equity was, prices were going down. Mm -hmm. And by solving the debt issue, their equity prices went right. up. So the companies are always trying to figure out what to do with their equity. In this case, they had to support the bond market because mm -hmm. it really was a bond vigilante type thing. And you know, that right. term used to get applied more to the Treasury side. But um, when credit investors got nervous and the rating agencies got nervous, these companies had to adjust it because it impacted their stock price. It's a great time, right? GE stock, I think, got as low as six, and oh, you know, it's yeah. done very well since this. AT&T, all these companies have rebounded very well, but it was an important step to address their credit concerns. It's interesting you bring up AT&T, not to focus on one company, but once GE was no longer the focal point, it seems like the market moves on to the next, the biggest triple B yep. issuer. And so now we follow those headlines very closely, simply because of how it relates back to kind of being the biggest player in this space in the implications for the broader markets. Um, and you're right, and that's what caused Powell to have to switch yep. from hiking, and we've never hiked again. <laughs> we have never hiked again, and I had to close down the J. Powell fan club so that I had founded on Twitter in public. Um, so uh, take us back. So here we are in New York. Um, you know, I left Wall Street in 2002, 2003. I left Wall Street. When I left Credit Suisse, they were just starting to sell collateralized, backed, you name it, mm -hmm. obligations of some kind. I, I was stupid enough to <laughs> raise my hand in a meeting and ask one of, the, one of the investment bankers at the front of the room in his Hermes time, like, who would buy the equity tranche? Who on earth would buy the equity tranche? Now, that was at the beginning. So walk us through kind of the evolution of, of, of fixed income products that are backed by other pools of of, of bonds, effectively, of securities. Yeah, and to me, it's I always look at it fairly simply. Let's say the U.S. Treasury is trading at 2%, and some other assets, let's call it loans, because they do a lot of CLOs, are, mm -hmm. are at 3%. So it's a 1% premium. You could buy that, and that's a sort of an investment ba base. And let's say it's a double B, so it's a limited investor base. Mm -hmm. Now let's say you can tranche that up, and all of a sudden you can create a large swath of AAA stuff that prices at 2.5%. So from that same pool? For a pool. And let's just make it a very simple 80-20 pool. So 80% now gets prices this AAA and trades at 2.5%. Mm -hmm. That means you can get 7 or 8% to that bottom 20%. Right. And there are people who say, well, that's like an equity type return. That's a really interesting return. Mm -hmm. And we'll do the work. And it changes how you think about it, right? The people at the top level of the cap structure, they don't have to worry if there's a few defaults here or there because right. they're protected against a fairly large loss. So they think of it one way, mm -hmm. and the people at the bottom end kind of do the analysis. They know they're going to get some defaults, but maybe even with defaults, they're getting 6%. So sure. they like it. So it starts redividing up that pool. And I think one of the important things was, leading up to the financial crisis, so much was getting AAA. Mm -hmm. And the thought process for AAA investors tends to be much simpler, because you're like, well, it's AAA. Triple How a. much work are you really going to do? Yeah, it's bulletproof. Yes. And the problem then became it really got applied to mortgages, and a lot of mistakes were made when they applied it to mortgages. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone said, well, mortgages have never gone down on a national, or housing prices have never gone down on a national average. Greenspan famously made that statement yeah. in his, his PhD thesis, which was finally uncovered when Sebastian Malady yeah. was doing his biography, was, was on housing bubbles. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, and so that kind of, they made mistakes with that. They made mistakes in how they did this tranching, they didn't you know, anticipate certain things, sure. and then they took those and retranched them. So they took these AAA, or in this case, triple B pieces, made another whole pool, created more AAA out of that, yep. and the mistakes they made in creating those triple B on the rating side mm -hmm. were remade in this, 
and that's what fell apart. That's what created the Big Short. Right. And you know, it, it was kind of fascinating to watch the Big Short. And you know, I know people have been talking about that, and the movie was great. The only thing I don't like about it is, actually, the part I really hate about it is, a lot of people pick the housing bubble, but they picked it in two thousand and six, or they picked it in sure. two thousand. And so the timing was great. Then the movie makes it sound like these are the only people who ever saw that this. Never looked. There were a lot of people who had these bets on, but lost too much money over time. Right. Yeah. So their timing was impeccable. They did a great job with it. Um, but that's what happened: is it created such cheap ways to short this, and when it got, went wrong, it blew up. You know. Yep. I mean, and, and that was you know I'll never forget running into President Fisher's office and saying John Thane just took twenty two cents on the dollar for these subprime mortgages that the bank was stuck with when it was still Merrill Lynch. I mean, it was really dramatic to see uh, the effect of liquidity or the lack thereof. Yeah. Because most people, you know, who think about the Federal Reserve and the risk they took on, they don't realize that they were made whole. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the bailout of the subprime market to the extent that the Fed did, did bail out the subprime market didn't lose taxpayers a penny. Right, and that's the. I think people do underestimate just how illiquid these things become, and part of it. It's going to sound a bit silly, but people will sit on a billion dollar portfolio, and they're looking at it, and they're trying to, instead of making one point one percent, they're trying to make one point one two percent. So they're thinking in terms of making that little bit extra. Right. And then when things start to go bad, all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, I could lose a billion dollars. The reality is, you're not going to lose a billion dollars. Right. But that there's mindset, value there. And that mindset shifts, and then you go to sell it. But it's invariably, if you're thinking that, now everyone's thinking that. So where's the new money to buy this? Mm -hmm. And because you get this leverage in the system, it becomes forced selling. Well, someone's now lost all their money, so they get closed out. Right. And that's really what happened with one of the Bear Stearns funds that kind of was at the heart of that crisis, which always reminds me. The one thing I remember, all of us, I think, saw it. You know, J.P. Morgan bought Bear Stearns, and I think the original price was $2 per share. People I'll are like never, tapping their screens. I like, will never forget that. I know they had to up the price, I think, eventually, but it was mm -hmm. like, don't you mean 20 or something? It was like, that was a shocking, shocking moment. Yeah, it was. I mean, and that was, uh, I had, I was pregnant with my twins mm -hmm. at the time, and, and, and I never had a free weekend <laughs> when I was at the Fed because every single weekend was like, where's Asia going to open? Because what's going to happen next? Because you didn't know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what a German Landis bank was from a man on the moon. But we find out that you know that that they owned a lot of subprime debt. I mean, it's just just, just the same way Japanese banks today own a lot of collateralized loan ob obligations, even though they've started to step back. Yeah. Um, so before we get too deep in the weeds, mm -hmm. can you explain the difference, just on a fundamental level, between a credit spread and a yield, a bond yield? So when you look at a bond, a Treasury yield, that's the yield. And then if you look at a corporate bond, it will yield something above that. Mm -hmm. So again, let's say Treasury, the 10-year Treasury yields 1.6%. And a investment grade bond yields 2.6%. That spread is the difference. So 2.6% minus 1.6%. Sure. And so when you look at like an ETF or a mutual fund, like LQD is a big investment grade, you can pull yep. up the yield and the spread on that. And that yield's really made up from two things. That's the overall Treasury yield. Mm -hmm and the spread, and that's, when I look at risk right now, I do think treasury yields are gonna go higher. Mm -hmm. I think credit spreads can do fine, but investment grade bond prices can actually go down as yields go up, because right. it's gonna be driven more by the um, treasury component than that spread component. And right. it gets a little bit tricky to think about, and I think that there's a lot of confusion. Um, I mean, a lot of people just can't get their head around, if the bond price goes up, the yield goes down. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, I mean, to, to to be an investor in bonds, to understand bonds, you have to kind of think backwards, mm -hmm. in a sense. And you know, when I look again, if we talk about the ETF space, you have something like an LQD, which has very long dated bonds. So I think the average maturity in there is 15 years. Right. Then there's something that VCSH is a Vanguard short term fund, which is only one to three years. Mm -hmm. So it, even if yields move a lot, that shorter data portfolio barely budges right. because that concept of maturity, which translates to kind of duration, mm -hmm. means that it moves much more for every. Well, there's a lot more rollover risk if your maturity is way yep. out there. So, um, so you've got all these kind of risks that fact, and so, you, which is why I think fixed income and credit investing is really fun, and a lot of investors can do well in it because if you have a strong view of 
the economy, what you think it's going to do to yields. What it's, there's always a product. You can do floating rate loans if that's what you think is interesting. Mm -hmm. yep. You can move to shorter maturity papers. So sure. it's really kind of a neat place. And I think people, they allocate, you know, maybe 40% or whatever of their to fixed income, but they don't adjust it often enough. They'll maybe put it in some big bond fund and just leave it there. And I think if they spent time on their portfolio with the tools between mutual funds and ETFs, they could do really well in that fixed income part. So ETFs, 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 um, two things. Uh, after the financial crisis, Dodd-Frank came along. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I mean, I can't tell you how many, how many times I, I shared with President Fisher the graph of, you know, the bond inventory is going down. The bond, in, the bond inventory is so far down, it was down 90%. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened there? And separately, what prompted Janet Yellen right before her term was over to openly express concern about, about bond-backed exchange-traded funds, ETFs. Yeah, so a couple of good things there. Uh, one is dealers used to take on a lot of inventory and they would buy and sell bonds all day long and that's how they made money, but- But they, they held bonds on their balance sheets. Right, because okay. you know, if say you wanted to buy a bond for me, then I'd go and have to go and find someone who owns that exact bond. Mm -hmm. And that's often hard to do. So you wind up building up a pool. You want to sell this bond. You want to buy this bond. So I start buying all these bonds. And then I have some to sell. And Dodd-Frank made that very uneconomic. It put much more capital on that. And it also caused a lot of issues of if I bought the bond today and it went up in price, maybe they wouldn't let me take that profit despite the fact I did a good trade. So you saw bond inventory shrink. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you've actually seen debt levels expand dramatically. So there's more. So I, I think that's, we saw it during the pandemic, just last year, you get these wild price swings because you kind of have this much inventory trying to go through this little space. Right. And it used to be the inventory wasn't as big and the kind of holding container that the banks had was larger. Right, right, it was so, like a, a, a cushion, it was a backstop for right. the market. So it kind of like acted as a shock absorber almost, right? right? Yes. Okay, now if the pressing seller if the pressures, uh, selling pressure kept going on, ultimately mm -hmm. that shock absorber goes away, but right. it buffered much more. It doesn't happen as much now, so you do get these more wild price swings. Mm -hmm. And I think ETFs contribute a little bit to that, partly because if you're a normal person, where would you go to look and figure out what high yield's doing? But now you can look at HYG or yeah. JNK and you can day trade it, you can do all these sure. things. And so I think people see that as a very you know, visible part of the market. Yep. And they start trading at discounts to net asset value, and that causes fear, that causes selling. Um, one real problem that we saw was at the during the pandemic, these mm -hmm. short-term credit funds, which let's say they only move 1% in a year, like they have almost no volatility. Right. They sold off 3 or 4% at first, but then they sold off as much as 10%, but the net asset value was only down 3%. So let's let's say the price should was 100 mm Mm-hmm. It's now 92, but the theory should be 97. Mm -hmm. And mutual funds that were similar priced to that were still priced at 97 because right. they priced. So what people were doing was selling the mutual fund to buy the ETF, yep. but that was causing the mutual funds to sell bonds. And I think that's the sort of thing that the Fed and Yellen as Treasury Secretary, she wants to watch how this interaction works out mm -hmm. and what they can do with it. And uh, it was no coincidence that when the Fed instituted all the um, emergency responses back in March, they allowed themselves to buy fixed income ETFs and everything else the Fed did in terms of the credit market was one to five years, or sorry, five years and in, investment grade only. But in the ETF space, they could trade any ETF. Yep. And so I think they understood how much of a signaling effect that small market, I mean, I think it's less than 1% of the market. Yeah, but th this was more extraordinary than what Mar Mario Draghi had done. I mean, if you think about the risk spectrum, you know, right after equity, you get to junk bonds and the Fed's buying a junk bond ETF. Did they, Peter, did they have to do that? Could they have, I mean, at some, on, on some days, the quantitative easing, they were buying $100 billion a day in, right. in the very, very beginning. Could QE alone have fixed? No, I don't think so. I think they want, they had to address some of these specific markets that it's much harder for them to do QE on anyways. Mm -hmm. And the ETFs are very, it's just so visible that I think they get much more bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. And if they were trying to buy bonds, they'd have to figure out which bonds were for sale. They'd have to build out a portfolio and they kind of get that through the ETF. Um, and the weird thing is at, 
I don't think they actually bought an ETF for several months because they actually didn't know how, they didn't have the piping right. to buy it. Yep. But the second they announced that they could, all these things rebounded instantly. So yep. it does show you the power of the Fed that they actually didn't have to buy a single bond in that space or a single ETF. And they got the exact reaction that they needed, which was all these discounts to NAB shrunk, the selling pressure ended because people couldn't attack that market. I think that was part of it, right? You yeah. couldn't attack it because you knew there was a defense line either there today or coming down the pipeline. Right. And it, it was a massive, and that to me, it's you just look at how powerful that psychology was, knowing they could do it. And I, I think it was actually very good though that they went ahead and followed through because they fixed that part of the market, but they went ahead and put the piping in place and figured out how to buy ETFs and they did go ahead and buy some ETFs. So mm -hmm. I think, if we get another type situation that emerges, and I expect it sometime in the next five years, again, we'll get this sort of period of volatility. I expect they'll put that plan in place overnight and try and you know control it much faster. Well, I mean, we, we, we don't have to go there, but Pat Toomey did kind of draw a line. And, and so the Fed has to come up with a, a new different kind of facility slash emergency, right. whatever it is. So in the process of, of basically putting a, a floor underneath the fixed income markets, a situation where corporate debt to GDP was the highest we'd seen it, now it's even higher. Is anything, has, anything, has anything actually on a fundamental level on balance sheets been fixed? No, but I also, I'm not that concerned about credit. I, and I think for a couple reasons. One is you look at companies like an Apple and Microsoft mm -hmm. that have issued a lot of debt. Yep. And traditionally a company with that much cash wouldn't issue debt but for a lot of reasons they went on that path. So uh, you almost have to subtract some of that debt out of it or take away their cash. So yep. that part gives me some degree of comfort. Um, but I also, I look at it more, how much equity is there relative to debt? Mm -hmm. And so the equity, and to me, you know, if we start having any sort of economic problems, mm -hmm. it's the equity that's gonna get hit far worse because that's, you know, and we've seen it time and again, and we saw it again with GE and the AT&T, they cut their dividend when they needed. They suspended mm -hmm. stock buybacks. Yep. So yep. I don't think it's, I don't see a credit problem. And if credit starts becoming a problem, it means equity has been a big problem already. So I, I'm, I keep a closer eye on the equity markets as a signal. Mm -hmm. And I think we just have a lot of buffer right now. There's, and, and you know, even through this pandemic, we did have a number of companies default. So we've cleaned some of the weaker entities sure. out. Um, I, I just think companies, have, especially investment grade companies, they have a lot of, levers they can pull to protect the debt holders, mm -hmm. which ultimately they will do because they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to go into bankruptcy and deal with that, which can often be messy. So, um, but to me, it's when you look at, I look at total debt versus total equity and the total equity to G GDP is also probably at record highs. Uh -huh. so that no is one. And the only other thing I do sometimes, uh, I, I think too often, we've also got to make sure we're looking at global GDP because most of the, especially if you think investment grade companies tend to be S&P 500 companies. Mm -hmm. Those companies, I think, do 40% of their business overseas. So we should really also be looking at how much, you know, GDP is there across the EU right. when taking these into account. And it, it's still at record highs, but it starts looking at least a little bit better because those companies really are, you know, global companies. So I, I tend to look at it versus global GDP, which, again, it's high, but it's not, you know, it's less so. Okay. And I'm hoping to be right on that. I think credit is going to be fine. Um, so let, let, let's stay on the Fed for a little while. Um, several things have changed in the last 12 months. Um, they're, they're looking to average inflation, making up for lost time. I think we, you know, prior to the, you know, the, the shocking April CPI print, consumer price index print, you know, they had hit 2%. I think eight, eight or nine times mm -hmm. since they, in, you know, put this yeah. target of two percent in. Um, what does average inflation targeting really mean? And separately, and you've written some really interesting things about this. What what does what does adding inclusiveness and diversity to the labor mandate to maximize employment? What does that do to Fed policy? Great question. So I'll start, I think, with the employment question. I, and mm -hmm. you know, I, Powell talked about it as specifically about minority unemployment mm -hmm. at his last press conference. Yep. And 
they've been talking about it more and more. And to me, this started late November. And I, I think they've looked at a couple things. What last time we got under four percent unemployment, we didn't get inflation, so that gives them some degree of comfort. But minority un unemployment was still, I think, believe close to eight mm -hmm. percent. And what they've seen in the past is minority unemployment tends to really respond only extremely well as we get to very low levels of unemployment. Mm -hmm. And since the Fed is very blunt tools, I think they've made a commitment to try and get minority unemployment down. Mm -hmm. And they would like to see that at 4% or less. And I think the only way they see of getting that is to get unemployment down to 3%. Yep. So I think they are going to let this economy run really hot. And they want, and they are now specifically watching minority unemployment separately to make sure that that's responding to their policy. Mm -hmm. um, they're making good strides in that, but I think that's a very different mentality than the Fed had before. I don't think they care about these subgraphs as right. subsets as much. So I think that's a big part of it, and I think that kind of drags us into the inflation. And this is one where I've got to be very careful because. My job is to figure out what the Fed's going to do, not necessarily what I would like them to do. Um, so I think critical the, distinction. So I think I think the Fed has made a very strong commitment to trying to drive unemployment down to three percent, and part of it they think they realize they're going to create inflation. So they are now looking at this long-term average, and it, it's not new, really. I think Kachula Kotera. I, Sorry, oh, Coach Lakota, yes. Sorry. He, he often talked about looking at average inflation. So mm -hmm. it's been out there, but it was never officially policy. Right. And I just think they are going to create inflation. And the first wave of defense is where we're at now, where they'll say everything's transitory. Then we'll move, and it's all of a sudden been too long to say it's transitory. Then they'll talk about two year or then five year average inflation. And then we'll get to a point where, okay, we have to do something. And we'll either see rate hikes, and I also think we'll see. I think people, you know, a lot of people want to talk about the Fed dots and the Fed at those meetings sure. puts out the dots of where they think interest rates will be. I think they're very, very committed to not moving those front dots. So I think they are going to stay wedded to not hiking, but the market's going to start realizing they're actually going to be successful at creating inflation. So the terminal dots or the long term dots will mm -hmm. actually have to go up and that we have to get to two and a half percent or something because we will have generated significant inflation. And I think they these are now just. I don't want to say their excuses, but that's going to be their strategy of why they don't have to hike. But aren't they playing with fire in a way? I mean, this is a whatever the the, the corporate bond markets. How big? Ten? Yeah. It's. Uh, I think they're. I think it. You know, again, I'm not as big fan of <laughs> going after this inflationary thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they run some other risks, right? You're seeing housing start to slow down yep. because people can't afford their right. projects. Yep. Um, well, we had we had purchase applications at the lowest level in a, in a year. Yeah, and you know, you talk to builders; they can't afford to build if they ha don't already have the materials. So mm -hmm. they, and you're starting to see some of those things like lumber and copper roll over a little yep. bit, but they're still at very very My elevated. Gosh. Yes. And that's going to hurt the economy, right? Because that's such a big part. If people aren't doing all these projects and getting homes fixed, mm -hmm. that's a big part of the economy. So I think we've got to be very careful what we wish for in terms of inflation. Um, I think the other big element to me has been this whole push towards sustainability. Um, I think that's actually inflationary. I think we're going to see um, companies realize, OK, it might be more costly to produce something onshore or move things away from countries that we don't think are doing a good job. And they're fine with that because I think they believe, and rightfully so, if they have a more sustainable product or sustainable, they can charge higher. Right. And their PE ratio can go up as well because there is an investment community that's looking mm -hmm. for that. So I think it's very different where we're at. And I think people are going to start scrutinizing supply chains even more. And not, you know, we all kind of realize, okay, supply chains maybe weren't super robust and we got to look at that. But I think there's going to be a lot more screening. Like, so why do you use this supplier? Why are they in this country? Are they doing something that we would not accept in the U.S. either to sure. our workers? Um, I also think we completely failed in terms of a lot of the healthcare issues. You know, every mask that we wore was still made in China. Yep. And 95 masks, which are the ones doctors get, right? Very hard to get in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that they're made by U.S. companies in China, there were restrictions on this. So I think we're going to see a big push to make sure that we do a lot more. Vaccine, vaccine production, medicine production onshore. I think that's going to be costly, but I think it's a necessary thing. As we just saw, we have to have this in our control. I well, think all and, and we've seen Chinese companies, you know, kind of try and get around tariffs, if you will. The Wall Street Journal had a good story about this. Uh, try to get around tariffs by going into countries and just buying up factories. <laughs> and so, 
it's a, that, that way they're producing from inside of another country. But, but you, you understand a lot about China. First of all, domestically, how does China, and I think that they're, they're pretty serious about this because they're not, Chinese officials are not reacting to the pandemic as they did even to the industrial recession in 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. when they poured a ton of money in the industrial sector. They really seem to be focused on shifting towards more domestic consumption-led growth. Yeah. But you've got some interesting views on what that implies for global inflation expectations. Perfect. Yeah. And so one thing at Academy Securities, we have 14 retired generals and admirals who work with us as our geopolitical. That's just fascinating. It's really fun. And one who just joined us, she's actually was an astronaut. I believe she flew the first uh, shuttle after the Challenger disaster. So yeah. she's great. So we, we get a lot of neat perspective. And I, I think one thing that we don't hear enough every day here and that we should always kind of remind ourselves, everything reports to the Communist Party in China at some level, right? So every single company, every single person ultimately falls under the Chinese Communist Party. The companies have obligations to provide information to China. So I think... Even private companies. Yes. There is really no such thing no as such a... No such thing as a private company. So that's Which why... Which is a hard concept for... Right. So they look and behave on the outside, but, you know, Huawei, for example. So one of our generals, General Stewart, who's been great, he was um, head of the Department of Defense's cyber. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was involved in the Biden transition team. So he was he's always been very anti Huawei and he's like if you get them they will have the data and they are obligated to pass that data back to the Chinese Communist Party if they request it so and they've got more than a third of global telecommunications so they're right. in a lot of places yes and so I think you know I do believe President Trump was actually on the right path when we're trying to stop some of this and it's mm -hmm. so when we look at China I think that's I, you've got to think that everything really is at some level centrally planned centrally organized and they look and behave like us in some ways, but not completely. And so our generals really pointed out, too, at that Alaska summit, basically mm -hmm. that was the first time China said, you know, no, you guys are doing it wrong. We're doing it right. And it's a wow. very different attitude towards China. And I think that goes hand in hand where I do believe they've made that pivot a little bit to where they're a more domestic focused economy. Mm -hmm. We get some of that from the signaling at the political level. Mm -hmm. You've also seen them let their currency strengthen. Uh, yes, you have. And I believe that's because if they are shifting to a domestic consumption-driven economy, <clears throat> the cost of raw materials is more important than selling cheap goods. Right. So why wouldn't they have st stronger currency so they can secure those raw resources? Mm -hmm. um, you've also seen China outsourcing, right? China now sends a bunch of their low-quality production stuff over to Vietnam and other countries. Right. So I think if they've made that shift... A lot of people are right now assuming all these supply chain issues and prices coming out of China are high and the currency's high, but that's just temporary because they're first ones back from COVID. I, I think it's going to go much beyond that. I think they really are saying, we've hit a point where we're much more you know, focused on our own economy. And even if you look a little bit what they're doing with Tesla, right? They invited Tesla in, they had it, and now it seems that they're trying to smear Tesla there and produce their own electric, electric vehicle. Electric vehicles, yep. So I think that's a big shift. And the end of all this cheap goods out of China maybe something we have to get used to, which again, will be very inflationary. Globally. Yes. And, and they, they've been really focused on building up their semiconductor industry. I'm glad you brought up semiconductors because I think that's really important. And it's also very important what they're doing with Taiwan. And so if you go back to thinking about Hong Kong, China, the one thing they kind of, everyone said Hong Kong was the center for financial, and so China would leave them alone. Right. And yet China built all those facilities up in Shanghai and other places so that they could replicate it, and it made it easier, I think, for them to be aggressive with Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Well, China has big, big banks. Yep. Yeah. So I think some of the largest banks in the world are all now Chinese mm -hmm. banks who were almost non-existent 20 years ago. And in the semiconductor stuff, I believe they're doing that to undermine the importance of Taiwan, right? So if you're in Taiwan, you start seeing China compete more and more on semiconductors. So some of your bargaining power goes away. And, I, and just, just to interrupt really quickly, I think let, let's put some perspective on this. I want to say Taiwan ex, ex, exports 54% of global semiconductors. Yeah, I think it's a number of like, uh, that, that magnitude. Right, right, right. And so China wants to subvert that importance because mm -hmm. China obviously wants to have... Um, Taiwan involved with it. They're doing military things. They're encroaching on their airspace. They're doing that. But they're also doing these economic things to undermine Taiwan's importance. 
And I, I think you start looking at this game where they play and Taiwan has to sit there and say, well, China wants us. The longer we wait, the less important we are to them. And we know China's still going to be here in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We're not sure where the U.S. interests are going to be. So I, I think mm -hmm. there's going to be a test of this administration to see how willing we are to support Taiwan according to the treaties or not. Um, you know, I, I think President Trump was very unpredictable, which had an impact. And I think that people want to test. If you go back to the Obama administration, I think we clearly had this policy where we would talk tough, say there were lines in the sand, and then retreat from those lines in the right. sand. So I think that's going to be tested. And we're seeing that globally with, I think, Ukraine, where Russia puts troops on the border to see what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we're going to see some more pressure mount in around Taiwan. But part of it, though, it circles back to your point on semiconductors. China is doing everything they can to grow their economy, be competitive. And I think they are going to be much more inward looking than just outward looking. And it's interesting that that you, you, you look at the perspective of Taiwan saying, OK, 10 years, 20 years out, you know, because they say Southeast Asia is kind of going. Go, and, and if another thing is, if Chinese, if China lets their currency appreciate, then they're going to be a bigger economy than the United States quicker. Yes. It's going to expedite that process. Right. It's going to expedite that. And it's also very powerful. I, I think we're almost in a global war for these um, rare earths and critical minerals. Mm -hmm. And so explain what happened in Greenland recently. So I find this one funny because, again, everyone, Trump is saying, said we should buy Greenland. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of laughed at the concept. And then just last month, the Wall Street Journal did a really good article on Greenland mm -hmm. where, in various parts of it, China is trying to what we call debt diplomacy. So they will lend to these projects and they want airports, they want ports, they want mining rights. Right. And ultimately, that's how they secure their interests. And I, I'm really concerned that the U.S. has some sort of vision of what we want to look like in five years in terms of greenness and very little practical plan to get there. Right. I don't think China cares where they are in terms of greenness, but they have a very practical plan in terms of you know, getting the resources to do that. So I think they're ahead of us on that. And if 20 years ago, wherever oil was produced, that's where U.S. interests were. Right. I think in five years, wherever these rare earths and critical minerals are mined, that's where our, our interests will be. And I think we're relatively behind China, who's already looks like that. Yep. And it's concerning. And Greenland was just, you know, it was so ironic that that's what they're doing there. And Greenland, according to that article, has 10 percent of the earth's supply of these rare earths and critical minerals. 10 percent. Um, so, you know, it's interesting you bring up uh, kind of China being ahead of the curve and the United States being behind the curve and debt diplomacy. I, I call it quiet colonization. Um, because the sheer number of countries uh, that they've invested in, as well as commodities export, exporters that have become very reliant. I'm talking about Latin America, South America here. But even Germany, to a certain extent. I mean, I mean would, you, would you say that the German economy is more dependent on that of the United States or China at this juncture? I would say in China, again, this is one thing that makes me a little bit concerned is, um, so the Trump administration was unilateral. China, we did everything we did on our own. We didn't care whether we had partners or right, not. Right, of course. And now there's a big push to you know work with Europe and stuff to have a coordinated plan against China. And the good part of that would be if we could get coordinated with Europe, we have a bigger group, and we should be able to get more out of China. My right. concerns are Europe is not very good at making decisions, as we've seen with Brexit. <laughs> and so you've got a partner who's not good at it. But then to your point, their ability to separate from China is much lower than ours. Right? You know. Um, COVID or, you know, what was it, the coronavirus back then first hit in Italy. And that's because Italy relies heavily on China for their fashion industry. Yep. So I, I'm a little concerned that partnering with Europe, while it sounds great, is going to be difficult because Europe doesn't make good decisions or doesn't make decisions. And their interests are definitely different than ours. They are much more tied to the Chinese economy. Again, it's, it's, it's economics. I mean, you know, here we sit today and an Italian bank defaulted on a debt payment. And I had to read the Bloomberg headline like five times. I was like, what? Where did that come from? And but my point is that after the financial crisis, they didn't use the excuse of a crisis to clean up their banks. And that makes that makes them even more reliable in a way because they're they're more economically fragile. Yes. Their, their banking system is, 
and everybody's relying on Germany mm -hmm. and its strong balance sheet, but then Germany's relying on China. Yep. And I think it, it's really going to be this global economic, you know, friction. Friction. And I think finally people have realized, you know, that ch I guess it goes back to the early days when we worked with China because we kind of wanted a threat to Russia or something. And mm -hmm. there was always this belief that somehow if we showed China the way, they'd want to become like us. And China does not want to become like us. China is going to remain China and mm -hmm. they've got their own agenda and that's to be big and better than anyone else. And I think we're finally accepting that and that's going to change how we look at it and address this. And you know, I, I love your term of a colonization. I've called it economic colonization. China has gone and done a lot of this. Let's say, and this comes from some of our generals, um, mm -hmm. we still have an opportunity to get some of this back. So what, we, what I've heard from some of our generals who are involved in this is five to 10 years ago, we were also pitching places in North Africa for access to their, and to work with us. And ultimately, most went with China because we tend to put all sorts of strings attached. Like, well, you have to have elections, you have to do this, you have, and all things that we wanted. And China just said, here's the money, here's we'll the money. do it. And they went down the Chinese path because it seemed easier. But what they realized is China brought in all the workers to make the roads. Mm -hmm. And China acts as though the resources are theirs, which I think if push comes to shove, they might be happy to make them theirs. So I think there's an opportunity for us to go back in and re-engage with some of these countries and come up again. Maybe this is what we need you to do, but you can do it over 10 years. Right. And not make radical changes and accept some of the issues that we didn't accept before. And maybe we can kind of corral some of these countries into our web. Right. Um, because I think that's what's going to be necessary to do, or we're all going to have an EV powered, you know, EV automobile culture without the ability to get the resources to, to get, make them. Right. And, 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 you know, I mean, now is kind of a critical juncture. The IMF is bailing out most of these countries, mm -hmm. and China can't collect on its debts. It's just. Right. And, you know, I think that's when we go all the way back to your questions earlier about corporate credit. Ultimately, mm -hmm. when a company defaults, mm -hmm. it, the equity loses out and the debt holders step in and they now own the company. And I, that's kind of the cycle, right? So default, it's going to be the debt holders come in and will own the company. I think that was China's intention all along. Mm -hmm. They oh, yeah. hope these projects don't work and they come in and take them over and they secure See, that, access. That's my to, port. Yep. <laughs> that, that's my, you know, that, that's my rail line, whatever it is. I mean, because and they've been so strategic in how... And people don't realize, I, I, I did the research recently, they're investing in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. They're putting money into Europe. They're putting money into, into Europe, European infrastructure. I mean, these are very quiet things they're doing, but they're not small dollars. They're not small dollar right. figures. And, and, you know, I think when we had the European debt crisis, Greece was a great example where they went after Greek ports and stuff. They go after whoever's weak, whoever needs money. Yeah. And they will try and go there. Yeah, I was in Melbourne prior to the pandemic and you know, I, I was on a waterway and I said, what a gorgeous port. They said, well, it's the, this is the biggest port in Australia. And they said, yeah, China's got a 50 year lease on it. I said, what? <laughs> and I believe it's one of the reports that our Navy uses as a like stopping area. Mm -hmm. So again, like I, I think people really have to think about what's China's long-term goal, where are they? And I, I, I hope our policy remains, I want global trade, I think that's important, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of things we can trade with China. I think we have to be very careful on high tech, mm -hmm. and we've got to make sure we protect our industries, we protect our IP, mm -hmm. um, we protect our data, and then at the other end, anything I think that's medical and healthcare, we, we got to make sure that we, we that. have a lot more control, or that it goes to our closer allies, mm -hmm. or you know, Mexico, and Canada, something where sure. we're not as dependent on a country that clearly we're frictionary with. So. Um, Talk to me about coincidence, since we're talking about China. Um, Russia, Iran, China. It, 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 is, is all of this happening at the same time by, by, by pure coincidence? I don't know whether it's officially coordinated, but it does seem this goes back. I think these superpowers, are they all want to test us. And mm -hmm. they are going to test this administration. And whether they're purposely doing it together or it's just coincidentally. but. I, I think it's also very problematic, right? Because it's one thing to deal with Russia. It's one thing to deal with Iran. It's one thing to deal with China. It's one thing to deal with any two at the same time. Now you're starting to have these three things come up. Yeah. Um, and each of these countries has very different philosophies and attitudes. And I think we can, you know, when we talk, say, even going back to China and Taiwan, we can all talk about the treaties and everything. 
the U.S. doesn't want to lose a single soldier, right? We, China, I, I don't think they would care if they lost a million soldiers. Right. So right. when we're looking at all these, you know, gamemanship and where the threat is, I, I think they realize that we have such a different attitude towards life, which is great, right. but it is going to make it very difficult for us to want to enter something that's going to cost lives. Mm -hmm. And I think the calculation for these other countries is not the same. And certainly, I'm not as much in Ukraine, but when we look at the Middle East, right, countries like Iraq have to be cautious with Iran and be nice to Iran somewhat because, again, it's unclear whether our interests remain there, especially now right. that we're less dependent on oil. So, right. And they've I, got nuclear. There's I mean, a lot of problems for mischief right now, and I do think things like cryptocurrency enhance that. Okay. So that's that's kind of where, that, that's where the train's going to pull into the station. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk crypto. Let's talk um, ransomware. What, what's happened recently uh, in the crypto space and are our regulators going to be, because of this big, huge pipeline kerfuffle, I mean, it was a, it was a mess. I mean, you had, yeah. you had gasoline up here on the East Coast go up to like $4 yeah. in just a matter. And so it was very visible to American consumers. Right. And it was really a transference of digital into physical is kind of how I like to think of it. Like, yeah. we've seen hacks and things before and you mm -hmm. read about it, mm -hmm. but it's never really had this physical impact. And all right. of a sudden, people couldn't get gas in some states. The prices went super high. Um, and so we've been looking at it a little bit from the geopolitical lens to begin with. So first, I think people are starting to realize crypto a lot makes sanctions kind of hard to implement, right? It's, right. You How know, do you enforce? If, if, if you can't see where the money is going, I mean, the IRS said it was going to tax any you know, crypto exchange north of $10,000. I'm like, how are you going to see it? Right. <laughs> Who's going to report that? Like, it's all, So I think things like that. So you've got you know, Iran, OK. How, will, how are they selling oil? Probably in crypto. How does Venezuela do that? Um, and one thing I find really fascinating when I look at crypto, I think that supports that, is when countries like Venezuela, something starts going wrong there, you tend to see crypto actually sell off. And you would think, oh, it's heightened you know, geopolitical risk. Something like a crypto or gold should rally. Gold will rally, but crypto won't. I believe that's because those countries are selling some of their stores of crypto yeah. to fix the problem. So I, I think there's that realization. And Again, when crypto was maybe a hundred billion or something, maybe people weren't really worried. You start to get Bitcoin alone at a trillion dollars, right? You can move a lot of money, do a lot of nefarious things, right. and that brings us to I think ransomware, or that's you know probably the biggest use case I think still in crypto is people want to get paid in Bitcoin. Um, you saw that that or Bitcoin or the other you know, crypto, um, and you saw that again in this pipeline case. Yep. The U.S. government through uh, FinCEN has already made it illegal for companies to pay or suggest that companies don't pay crypto through their US entities. But there's a whole cottage industry of people who've set up now to help companies pay for the ransomware. Yep. It's very prevalent. That one company that hacked the pipeline supposedly already made 350 million this year. I know. I, I mean, just it was, again, I, I'm almost relieved that this pipeline crisis occurred as quickly as it as it was distilled. But but it really opened everybody's eyes to I mean, I mean, right. they paid real money to these people. Yep. And so I think there's, and I don't know whether you saw, but it looks in the aftermath of this, some of the companies that helped supposedly make, put the payment together had denial of service attacks and stuff like that. So I don't know whether that's us getting back at the companies that facilitated this. So I think ransomware is much easier to collect via crypto than it would be in dollars. Sure. And again, we can track the dollars. We find out where it goes. So... I think the government's going to take a really close look at, is crypto actually encouraging this hacking behavior? Is it creating greater risk ransomware? Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side of it, I think we are working, you know, as some of our people are involved in this. We've got to shape probably a better policy to really go after this because, you know, okay, we know who did this, but maybe nothing China, happens to them. Like, oh, slap on the wrist, right? Maybe China can tell us what to do because yeah, it seems like they're trying to clamp down on their citizens' ability basically to hide money yes. in crypto. Yeah, and it, you know the use case, right? It's if you think about it, you the one thing that makes sense is if you live in a regime that's difficult and you're scared of that regime, you want to use something like crypto. Well, China is certainly going to make it difficult. Um, you know, I believe it was two or three years ago. I think China, every cell phone has to have facial recognition. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, because they won't take an excuse. No, someone stole my phone. They'll know it's you because it's facial recognition. Right. And they want to track you. They want to punish you. They will and so I think they're going to do, and I found it really ironic, some of the crypto people would get very excited when China showed more and more interest in crypto, 
And I was like, I think this is a bad thing for the existing yeah, no, crypto. No, no, no. Yeah. China wants its own digital currency. Right. You, you can go on Ant today if you're yeah. in, in, in Shanghai and yeah. check out with the digital currency. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of the shopping bag. It's and a 20-year option. To tie this all full circle back to where we were with China, you know, switching how they, they view their economy and where they stand. Right. I think they want their currency to appreciate. I think they want it to become more considered as a reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why they're early to the digital, right? It will allow them to do things that can't be done with physical dollars that I think will encourage people to use their currency more. So it, they've got this multi-pronged strategy and I think digital currency is gonna be bad for crypto, but it will actually, again, push China's currency more into you know, a reserve currency type status. I don't think they get to reserve currency, mm -hmm. but that seems to be their plan. They've been pushing on it from every angle and that's just another one. I, I completely agree with you. Um, one last question, yeah. Peter. What does it say about the crypto space in general that one individual can go on Saturday Night Live? That one individual can say, oh wait, it's got a nasty carbon footprint. I mean, how he didn't know that before, who knows? But what does it say about, you know, chief financial officers of the world, uh, that, that they're actually, well, if Elon Musk has, has, if Tesla owns Bitcoin, then we can put some of our corporate cash in it. And then if, if he says no, then they all fall. I mean, what does it say about I, I think this, this phenomena? I think this put a huge dent into that sort of progress, if you want to call it. I think companies that were reluctant mm -hmm. or like kind of being feeling they were forced into it. And yeah. part of it is because there's such little yield on anything. These right. companies have cash. They're trying to figure it out. They can earn, you know, and Bitcoin was looking like an interesting alternative, especially with Elon Musk saying it was there. I, I think people have to take a really hard look at that and say, this isn't a currency. It's a asset of some sort. Right. Um, definitely not a currency. It doesn't really behave like a currency. And I think this recent price action should be scary. I think they do have to think about the, you know, how much energy usage is there. I've heard if, you know, crypto was a country, it would be the 10th largest energy user. Gosh. And, and like 50, 60% is mined in China. Correct. And I'm sure it's no coincidence that China also built more coal-fired plants last year than the rest of the world. Like, So I, I think people have to really think, what does this all mean? And mm -hmm. you get some people who say, well, it's really just going to push the advent of green tech. I don't think so. And I think there was a lot more going on than just Elon Musk. But that volatility is insane. Mm -hmm. And even on the way up, I've always questioned, you know, if you think of a normal asset, right, and you want to buy $100 million of something. You try and do it quietly. You try and do it so you get the lowest price possible. Right. It was very unclear to me whether some crypto stuff wants to trade it inefficiently so they drive the price from forty to 50000 on a relatively small number. On a Sunday afternoon. Right. And you don't know how many transactions. Like, and you hear about all these transactions. But even if you think about the stock market, right, the transaction volume, it's all because one trade leads to 10 other little trades. Like, right. And there's all this going on. I suspect that the crypto community is not as robust as we think. And mm -hmm. the depth of liquidity isn't really there. Mm -hmm. And that some of these actions that have taken place may have been purposely to push up the price. I always kind of think of, you know, three rules of crypto. But the one rule that always comes to me, there are no rules in crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and they're starting now trying to enforce things like, again, everyone can write about whatever they want on crypto, say whatever good things they want. There's no verification. There's, and you know, Wall Street cracked down on that. You had to actually yeah. you know, talk about your companies. You couldn't lie. Like there were a lot of things. Sure. And none and of that- And crypto is like the wild, wild west. Right, there's no SEC enforcing it. And that's part of, you know, I guess it's charm, but it's part of the dangers. Like you really have to understand there are people who have heavy, heavy incentives to get you to go into crypto. And I'm not always against crypto. I wrote, you know, at the start of this year, I was asked, you know, three interesting alternatives. And I wrote buying crypto because it was only 30000 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I felt there were more and more places accepting it. The usage case was going on. Sure. And then I've grown to dislike it. And, you know, I like, disliked it at 50. It went to 60. You got to 30, now 40. But I still don't like it. I think something's changed me. And I think right. we're going to get a lot more government regulation. Mm -hmm. And this awareness that it's really is still too much of a criminal element involved. Right. Well, I, um, you know, this is, it's going to, to be determined because there's an entire generation that, that's got their eyes on this. Um, well, let's, uh, let, let's do this again in about a year and we can talk about where Dogecoin is. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh my or God. whatever new one is. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much for taking so much time, Peter. I, I really do appreciate it. Me. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope that now you know that when bond prices go up, yields go down and that you've learned a lot about the credit markets. Uh, that was an incredibly wonderful deep dive with Peter Shear. Uh, and I would invite you, there's another expert that I, I recently interviewed, Christopher Cole. If you want a similarly deep dive into the volatility markets, 
then have a look at that episode if you missed it. And I look forward to the next time. Again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so now. And I'll see you next time for the next episode of Down the Middle. Thank you.